David, thank you so much for being with me today here on See Here Love and in front of a live studio audience. How does this feel? It feels great. Yeah? It's You're feeling the energy and everything it's too? It's fun to be here. <laughs> it's great. You know, I really appreciate the work that you do with the Barna Research Group and it's such a great resource for us all over the world and, and to Canadians as well. So thank you so much for yeah. the good work. Make sure you say thank you to your team from yeah, us. Yeah, uh, thank you. I will. I'll, I'll pass it on. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> now, David, you know, we're sitting here as we start part one of a, of a two-part series called Love Jesus, but not the church, question mark, mm -hmm. which sounds a little risque, right? But I have a feeling that you're familiar with risque and some controversy. Yeah, in, in terms of interviewing people, you know, I've been at this company now for 24 years, and we've interviewed people across the full religious spectrum, and especially I've tried to focus on this next generation mm -hmm. of young people, uh, and we often hear that idea that they really do love Jesus. Jesus is an admirable character, and that's what the stats show. Um, but they also have this real like sort of love-hate relationship with the church. Yeah. Uh, and so I've been uh, really as a professional listener trying to understand that phenomenon. And uh, that's where that, that title comes from. My, my friend Dan Kimball, they, uh, they love Jesus but not the church, I think was a, a great phrase that encapsulate that perception of the church. It's fantastic. I love that being a professional listener. I think we need to all be that. I think that will change a lot of things it if we would. became better listeners yeah, than I think, talkers. I think it's something that we as researchers have to offer the church today is to the, sort of the skill set of listening. Mm -hmm. Well, today is part one because in your surveys and your research, you're saying that millions of young adults are leaving the church and some even their Christian faith. Yeah. So that's part one. And then part two, when you come back, David, we're going to talk about how to keep young adults in church and strong and resilient in their faith and following Jesus. Yeah. So part one, this is really good. And I think it's, 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 it's timely because in the wake of this whole hashtag Exvangelical. We're hearing public leaders, you know, leaving the church and leaving their faith. And I'm going to say I because I don't want to say we because it means like I'm putting that out there for others' responsibility, but I need to take responsibility myself. Right. I want to know why. What am I doing wrong? And and how can I help the church and and communities help people who are really wrestling with faith and leaving? So this is so timely. Yeah, thanks. I mean, again, it's, uh, it's actually, it's a bit heartbreaking to be a researcher who hears the stories of people who deconvert, mm -hmm. who break up with their, their faith. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we do a lot of quantitative, we do a lot of qualitative research. We're sort of geeks for Christ's sake. Uh, that's, you know, I'll thank my team of, of nerds and geeks because we're, we're statisticians and researchers. But the, the emotions of that are pretty hard, you know, when you're talking to a family or you hear from a son or a daughter who says, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me. I don't want to be a Christian anymore. Uh, and so um, it's important that we hear those stories. And, you know, we live in a culture now where uh, it's, it's a lot easier to admit that you just don't believe. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a context in which secularism is, is thriving. And yet we also find a lot of signs of hope, a lot of people that are sort of very, very faithful in their, in their uh, pursuit of Jesus as well. That's good. I love hope. <laughs> yeah. so we, need, we need some of that along with the bad news. Yeah. So, David, you did a survey <laughs> for five years with young adults ages 18 to 29 and ask them why they're disconnecting from church. You right. found that three out of five are disconnect, disconnecting from church permanently. And here's why, because you have six reasons. Mm -hmm. Did that shock you that stat three out of five are disconnecting permanently from, from church or you know, institutionalized religion? Yeah, I mean, we had done enough work that we saw that 20 somethings as a, as a generation, and you know, we talk about them as millennials or mm -hmm. Gen Z, and you know, researchers and marketers make up the idea of a generation in the first place. But, uh, it was true that this younger generation is struggling with their faith in ways that previous generations haven't. They don't start their religious explorations as a Christian. Um, so in some, in some way it didn't surprise me because I had been seeing you know, mm -hmm. from, from our, some of our research that they were really struggling. Um, and some, some people thought it might be higher, like eight out of 10. Uh, but we found that it was about 60%, 59% at the time this book called You Lost Me came out, um, where it's 59% of young people who are raised in the church, three out of five as you say, had walked away either from their faith or from the church. And here's the reason. So you have six reasons why, yeah. and I want to kind of, t you know, understand these more. So reason number one, you found that young people were leaving the church because churches seem overprotective. And you say that here it says 23% of them say Christians demonize everything outside of the church, and 22% say church is ignoring the problems of the real world. Yeah. Wow. Uh, one of the people we interviewed for this said uh, that at her church meetings they had to eat um, angeled eggs rather than deviled, deviled eggs. eggs. And probably not like a, 
a pot luck, but a pot blessing. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, there's all, and, and so this is a generation that feels like they're living sort of in but not of. They've got one foot in the church, one foot in culture. They're viewed by their culture, their peers, as crazy for believing this stuff. They're viewed by the church as too liberal, too, you know, too worldly, too whatever. And so they feel stuck. And that, that perception of being overprotective is like, oh, come on, the, the real world, um, you know, it's like we're not going to be undone in our faith by eating a deviled right, eggs. Right, right. So. But I think, too, I mean, here you're saying, you know, that these young adults are saying that Christianity feels stifling, fear-based, and risk-averse, which, you know, I, I, can, I can understand that when you're talking about things like we're dealing with deviled eggs and angel eggs, right? Yeah, when in the real world we're dealing with divorce and depression. Well, exactly, and exactly. And, you know, ter terrorism and, you know, gun violence in the yeah. States. You know, there's like, there's so many different pressures. Uh, and this generation's like, that's the real world. Like, you exactly. know, we, we, like we want to see our faith alive and, and active right. in that world. And, and I'm, I'm seeing here, and I've, I've talked to some other young people who said, you know, church ignoring the problems of the real world means, you know, the church isn't dealing with things like LGBTQ plus you know, issues, we're seeing homophobia in the church, misogyny, racism, lack of care for the environment, which is a big issue for young people, women's rights, women in leadership in the church. It's like it, it, it's not connecting from outside yeah. of the church. They're working through this, dealing with these things, seeing women in leadership and, and people advocating for equal rights. And in the church, it's a problem. Well, there's so many different layers of the criticisms. And again, um, I, I, it would be an interesting conversation even about how I insulate myself as a researcher to hear the criticisms and to stay hopeful yeah. and you know I mean I just this is a, 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 bit, a bit of a side note but I mean I, I have to focus on my own time in scripture my own church community mm -hmm. my own my own relational community my own friendship I mean getting getting counseling and ther therapy and talking about because I, you know I'm sort of like the Geiger counter our team yeah. is like the Geiger counter for all the challenging <clears throat> all the challenging conversations that this generation and others are having about faith and uh, this is the thing that Jesus and, and his hope in us actually helps us to address those very complicated questions. Uh, and that's my hope in the church is that it could actually lean into these kind of skeptic skeptical questions that, the, that this generation is raising. But they are asking that and more, yeah. uh, race, gender, um, sexuality, uh, and environment, you know, sort of gl global, global affairs, uh, vocational issues, um, parenting, you know, um, uh, genetics, um, you know, just the, the world of science and technology. It's, a, it's an incredible time to be alive, but this generation is sort of feeling like the church is sort of putting them in a small, small box. Yeah. Uh, when in fact Christianity should make us more alive to those realities. And, and, and brave and courageous to discuss these without feeling like loss of control or, you know, that we might not have the answers, so what are they going to think of us? Right? Yeah, and I yeah. think we're going to get into that as well. Okay, reason number two. Teens and 20-somethings experience of Christianity is shallow. 31% say church is boring and 24% say faith is not relevant to my career or interests. Yeah, this was a huge one for us uh, that, uh, you know, almost like, uh, three out of four young people who graduate from a, from a you know, sort of a Christian experience, uh, gr graduate on from, from primary school on to secondary or, or, or uh, higher education, say they have no idea how the Bible might apply to their career or field of interest. They grow up as a Christian, but they're not vocationally discipled. And so the church is very shallow when it comes to their career is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. That's actually, that's really key. I think that it's not relevant to my career interests. I think, I think in part two, we're going to talk about how the church can be involved. Yeah, how it's in stepping into stepping that. Stepping into yeah. it, yeah. Okay, number three reason mm -hmm. why young adults are leaving the church. Churches come across as an, an antagonistic to science. That surprised me that 35% of those that you survey Christians are too confident they know all the answers. Huh. And yeah. it's funny because a lot of people are like, well, we, should, we need to know all the answers. We need to respond when, you know, when, when a young person asks me this question, I need to know everything. And they're saying it's, it seems too confident. Well, I think we're, um, we're living in a science and technology world. You know, you know the, the technology, digital devices, smartphones have fundamentally changed human experience. Uh, I mean, people will be watching this program, you know, on a, on a tablet or, you know, yeah. streamed or whatever, uh, you know, along with broadcasts and other kinds of options. But like, like the, the smart, smartphones, have changed our world. Science is, you know, undoubtedly changing what it means to be human and how we think about, again, uh, reproduction. Um, you know, um, my kids at school have have friends who were, uh, you, you know, who don't know who their parents were. Yeah. Um, they have they have an adopted, you know, adopted parents, but they they were, you know, sort of 
biologically created, and um, so it's just a, it's a it's a weird and amazing world. And so this generation, I think we we owe them a chance to talk about the theology of science. Mm -hmm. Um, we live in a, in a power, like my son, one of his favorite shows was Mythbusters. You know, is it, is it, is it true? Is it plausible? Is yeah. it, you know, they, they of course go through and test these different urban myths and they, they figure out what, is it possible that these things happened? And um, you know, the fact that he has spent so much time watching that, we live in a, in a YouTube era where they're watching different, you know, people skateboard and you know sort of like lectures from all sorts of places and so science is a is a dominant yeah. force and we have to teach this generation how to think about the world that's of science good. that we live in. Dave that's good and not be afraid of it because some exactly. people feel more afraid. All right reason four young Christians church experiences related to sexuality are often simplistic and judgmental and research indicates that most young Christians are as sexually active as their non-Christian peers so there's no difference within the church and out, young people are having sex. Christians have more guilt. So, <laughs> uh, that's true. So we're all having sex, but Christians have yeah, guilt. And there's okay, that's what you're saying. Ways, there's a lot of different ways to slice the data. In, in, in some ways, what's interesting is this generation, they're, 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 the secular researchers are talking about what they call sex recession uh, because young people are having sex less. Um, there is uh, availability of pornography. Um, their the relationships are different. Um, I see it in my kids and my kids' friends. Uh, you know, in high school, they don't have, the, they, they sometimes have romantic relationships, but that sort of defined my high school experience. All, all of my friends had boyfriends and girlfriends, and, and um, you know, this generation, they, they're like, well, someday we might have a significant other, but we'll sort of see. And that's just actually one of the most significant changes wow. demographically as people are, are taking longer to go through the primary you know, sort of getting married, having children, right. all the rest. But, but anyways, the, the church is viewed as repressive. Repressive and judgmental. Towards One of the things too here, they say that most of the young people say that when they have been in, in a sexual relationship or had sex, they feel that the church is judgmental towards them, even if they've made that mistake. Right, right. Oh, church, right? It's the one thing we, we should be best at is offering grace yeah. and restoration, uh, sort of truth and love. And it's... Uh, uh, this is a generation, it, the, the, when I did this book called Unchristian years ago, I felt like the, uh, the, the primary pr complaint of this next generation is that they're like the prodigal son. Uh, they're, they're like the, the people that are you know, sexually active and you know, they don't understand a Christian worldview, whatever. And, uh, but the church is almost like the older brother. And so we're the ones that are often sort of, we're more comfortable in our self-righteousness. So uh, mm. the, the, the Jesus is just as concerned with our self-righteousness as he is with so, unrighteousness. Yeah. And we have to really concentrate and, and think about how do, we, how do we dig up our souls towards you know, a more grace-filled response to issues of sexuality in this generation. It's good. Okay, I've got a mosey on here because I think I'm way, <laughs> way behind. Reason number five, but I wanna get through these. Uh, young adults are leaving church because they wrestle with the exclusive nature of Christianity. They have been shaped by a culture that esteems open-mindedness, tolerance, and acceptance. And they feel that churches are afraid of others' beliefs and that church is like a country club only for insiders. Wow, that's the, that's big. There's a lot of different uh, yeah. dimensions there, but the the idea that they live in a world that's pluralistic, they don't understand why the exclusive claims of mm -hmm. Christianity might make sense in a world where you know, like God loves all people. Why you know, He's a God of love, but so why would He, uh, you know, want to condemn anyone to hell? So they they wrestle a lot with those questions of human suffering, of uh, you, you know, sort of the, the exclusive claims of Christianity that you have to become a Christ follower in order to go to heaven. Okay. Wow, these are some really big reasons, but it, I mean, it's, it's amazing that young adults are thoughtfully thinking through these and able to articulate. Like, these are some of the things that we struggle with. That's and, why we're leaving. And you can see why sometimes as a researcher, I go home in, in a fetal position. <laughs> oh, David. And, uh, <laughs> and you're like, oh, man. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a hard work. It's, yeah, it uh, is. It's, 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 it's a, a true calling to try to listen and understand these criticisms. Well, and, then, and, then, and understand sometimes they're true, and sometimes they're almost true. Right. Well, I'm glad you're doing it. Finally, reason number six, last one that young adults are leaving the church, they say, because the church feels unfriendly to those who doubt, that 36% said they feel that they are unable to ask my most pressing life questions at church, and that um, the church is not dealing also with mental health issues. Yeah, there's it's a lot big. of things we've been talking about, yeah. all the doubts across each of these five areas, yeah. um, you know, science, d uh, depression, sexuality, um, you know, can we be honest with ourselves and with others? And uh, the church should not be a place that's doubtless, it should be doubt-filled because that actually propels us toward God. That's good, David. Okay, just summing this up, David, what would your encouragement to be, be to, sorry, young adults thinking about leaving the church or their faith? What would you say to them? 
Uh, well, I mean, I think even some of the work that we do in listening to others, um, it's interesting how sometimes our criticisms become bigger than our ability to hear what, you know, what God is saying to us. Um, I truly, deeply believe there is a God who speaks to us and wants to call him to himself. And so to those that are struggling with the, the kinds of questions we've talked about or those that we haven't had a chance to uh, talk about, um, uh, I think that God hears you. I mean, the, 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 the person who's created you understands the nature of doubt. He created us to have these big questions uh, because they uh, enlarge our hearts and allow for us to see the world as it is. Uh, so, you know, to, to lean into those questions, but to, to realize that there's a person who, who, who created you to be with the ability to ask those questions in the first place and who loves you despite those things. And to the Gen Xer and the Boomer who are leading young adults in churches, ministry, and organizations, what would you say to them? Well, this is a generation that's growing up in a truly different context, and it frustrates me to no end when people say, hey, there's nothing new under the sun. There's the same things we saw <laughs> in the 1960s. And, you know, of course, there was a, a complicated time then, but this generation is today facing unprecedented challenges in the digital age. And so we have to be courageous to, to meet them where they're at in, in their questions, in their doubts, mm -hmm. in their reasons for walking away. That's good. Well, I'm so glad there's a part two to this <laughs> because we just sort of felt this, this sense of like, here are all the reasons young adults are leaving. But in part two, we're gonna look at how the church, how myself, how leaders can help bring you know, young adults back into the church or stay in the church and build a resilient faith. So thank you, David Kinneman, so much for your time and your thoughts and your research here today on See Her Love. Of course, my pleasure. Okay, so we went way over. High five. That was not 10 minutes. Melinda. That was my fault because I was so engaged I couldn't. I, sorry, Lee. Lee, I wasn't ignoring you, but I was. <laughs> Melinda's hair by Paolo Marola. Melinda's clothing sponsored by Denise Boutiques. Clothes for every woman. Shop Denise.ca.